I am very excited to talk to our first guest of the day. Her name is Juliana Miller. She just won the Ultimate Fighter. And as we said at the top of the show, she is a character. And I really like characters. And I think this sport needs more characters. And so without further ado, let us say hello to Juliana Killer Miller. There she is. Hello, Juliana. How are you? Awesome. Excited to chat with you today. Uh, I thought, maybe, you know, no intro. We're not doing the intro. Is that it? And now, welcoming to the MMA Hour show, Juliana the Killer Miller. I love it. I love it. Well done. Well done. Uh, I was going to have Max or something just for the pizzazz. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I appreciate everything. I will be honest with you, and I've said it on the show, so I'm not you know, messing around. I, I don't, I don't watch tough. I think there's a lot going on. I think the, the product is a little watered down. When I saw you on Saturday, pre stuff, post stuff, the crotch top, everything. I was like, this freaking girl is incredible. Like I, I, I loved everything that you did. You went in there and you made your presence felt. Is this something that you have thought of? Like, Oh, I can't just be another face on the roster. I can't just you know come in there wearing the same thing as everyone acting the same as everyone. I need to amp this up. Or is this just you and you just kind of not overthink these things and and like to be a little different. Yeah, to be quite honest, I'm 100% myself no matter where I'm at. It can kind of be a downfall because clearly I talk a little bit too much. But um, I think life's too short to try to have some persona. So I kind of just say what I'm feeling at the time and uh, shoot my shot. You know, I just like to go for it and bring the energy and, um, you know, love me or hate me. I find that people just can't stop watching. So I think it's working out. <laughs> I love it. How did you get on the Ultimate Fighter? How did that process go down? Wow. So um, Cole Hooper, actually, one of the producers, he sent me a message on Instagram, was like, hey, I've seen all your jujitsu matches. We need you on the show. And um, I actually thought it was a joke because on his profile, he has like a lot of like... Uh, like raver pictures and stuff and I was like man this person's messing with me and uh, I messaged my managers Eric Apple and Matt and um, they're like no this is real you should apply so I, I got very blessed they found me and I think maybe they they saw some of my performances and they're like we need this girl she's got crazy energy so and so yeah. in total by the way did you have to try out or were you in right away I was in right away. They wow. didn't, because of COVID, they didn't do tryouts for the last two Tufts. Um, they had everyone come there. We did like three series of interviews and then they chose eight and that was one of them. Okay. And so in total, how many weeks were you in the house? Five weeks in the house, one week in lockdown. So we were gone six total. What was lockdown? Lockdown was they brought us all to this hotel and we were in lockdown. We didn't even get our room card keys. They walked you to your room what? and they had to walk you out of your room. Yeah. So you got there, they walk you to the room and they're like, okay, call 513, whatever hotel room they were in. And like upon that, they would come and get you, take you downstairs to get food. They would do whole foods, drop offs, food drop offs but you had to be escorted in and out of your room to leave. The only time you got space on your own is if you're like, I need to go on a run outside. So they'll walk you outside. You'll go on your run. You call once you get back and they walk you back up to your room. Wow. Now, was this before the show or after the show? Uh, one week before the show. Yeah. To make sure we were going through COVID tests every single day. Um, it, was, it was, The lockdown was pretty intense. I think we were all a little bit jumbled from that. <laughs> And uh, phones, no phones, TV, no TV. Did you have any connection to the outside world? Um, yeah. So the first two and a half or three days in lockdown when they hadn't like chosen the cast yet, we had our phones. But the day before anything got released about who was going to be on the Ultimate Fighter, they came and took all of our phones. Oh, my God. So it was about three days in there. No phones, um, no music, no media or whatever. How'd you pass the time? Um, pre them taking my phone, I went back and I studied all the ultimate fighter seasons, which was awesome. Um, I watched Juliana season, uh, Tatiana Suarez, huge fan of her, watched her season. Um, cause similar to you, you know, like, uh, I'd actually never seen ultimate fighter, uh, before I was kind of like huh. locked in that room. 
Wow. So I just I just spent all my time reading and studying on what I was doing. And honestly, after watching all the seasons, I was like, I did not bring enough cute clothes. So I Amazon ordered a bunch of cute stuff to the hotel room. That is amazing. Now, did you go like back to season one, two, three, four, all the way back then? No, I didn't necessarily watch all of them. I chose seasons that I thought were really cool. So I watched like the Chuck Liddell season, uh, Rampage. I maybe watched like one, five, 29, like 17. Like I watched a bunch of random ones that had characters that I thought were awesome that I wanted to know more about. And then every single woman season too. Got it. I watched the girls, uh, of course, like Rose's season. Um, so I, I was kind of like choosing specifics. And so then you get into the house and what was that like being in there five weeks with these other fighters, you're being shadowed, followed, filmed, that whole process. Did you enjoy it? I loved it and I hated it for the same exact reason. I loved that for the first time in my life, you know, I wasn't working four jobs. All I had to do is wake up, make my breakfast, train, sleep, train again. Being able to be fully focused was amazing. So I loved being trapped in that house away from everything. But it was my least favorite thing, too, was being trapped in that house because I lived alone. I love my little place. It's quiet. And there, as soon as people started losing, you know, everyone would get drunk and be loud all night. And I'm trying to stay focused, keep my head in the game. And there's no room doors. The only place that you have a door is actually in the bathroom. So there was multiple nights I would literally pick up my mattress and put it in the bathroom just so I could close the door. Because, wow. like, earplugs wouldn't work. Um, and then some girls are so cool. Like, Claire Guthrie, she is so cool. Like, as we started weight cuts, she'd come up to me and hug me. And she's like, good luck on your weight cut. Let's put on a show, you know, super chill. Then there's girls like Brogan that are going to be mean eyeing you anytime you walk in the room. They're just looking at you grumpy. Or Mo had it the worst, honestly, with Mitch. Anytime Mo would walk anywhere... Mitch would be like, oh, bro, you better get those hands ready. Are your hands ready, dude? Like, he was in his head, Mitch. Oh, my gosh. Mo couldn't even walk past the kitchen without Mitch saying something all day, every day. So it's quite a roller coaster, but it's one of those things that's like, that's the best and worst part of it, you know? You just got to be there for it. And so when you get out of the house, like, what is that like? Because then you get back your phone. I would imagine there's like a pile of stuff just waiting for you, right? It is so weird. Um, As soon as we got out, every single person in the house had this problem. We turn on our phones and you try to look at the screen and everything is blurry. Like our eyes were not acclimated to screens anymore. It was like, wow. I, the first thing I wanted to do is call my grandma, of course. So I try to like look for her contact and it took me like three minutes to figure out my phone because my eyes were just like, couldn't function on the screen. Um, going into uh, grocery stores was weird. I I hadn't even like smoked weed or anything in a long time. And I went in the grocery store and I was all paranoid. I was like, whoa, what is this place? Like, I forgot what this was like being in here. I'm like, you just like buy things? Like, oh, it's so weird. You know, I got kind of spoiled with like, oh, just write what you want on a list, you know? <laughs> so it was it was really interesting. Um, was it hard? Super cool. So, so was it hard not to smoke weed for six weeks? No, because I didn't bring anything with me. I think that if I had like snuck some in my bag and I had it sitting there, like, oh, it would be hard, but I was so in the moment and so focused that, um, I didn't even care. Actually this camp, I did the same exact thing as I did in the tough house. Um, I would have times of night where I would shut off my phone I wouldn't be on my media. I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. And I actually am not even craving those things anymore while I'm in camp because I want to win so bad. Uh, I loved the focus. That that, that was my biggest learning from the Tough House is how incredible of an athlete I can be when I'm fully focused. So um, I went right back to it. And yeah, it it wasn't hard. It's just like exciting. Sometimes we've seen uh, fighters, you know, get picked by, uh, uh, you know, the, the coach champion, whatever it is. So in your case, uh, Juliana Pena. And then when the show's over, they go train with them. Did you consider doing that? You have a great team in San Diego. You've got the likes of Alima Lee McFarlane, who I know you're very close with and, and Manny, who's uh, a great coach in his own right, that whole squad over there. Did you consider going to, uh, to Washington and, and, and train with Juliana? Cause she had her fight around the same time as yours. 
I did. Yeah. So before I started the major part of my camp, I actually went to Chicago to train with her. Um, okay. She lives in Chicago now. Um, her head coach is in Washington, which I will also want to go cross train with one day. But um, yeah, before the major part of my camp, I went and cross trained with her. Um, nothing but love. But when it came down to the nitty gritty, um, in the middle of weight cuts and stuff, my coaches didn't want me taking six hour flights back and forth because I told them I wanted to stay focused. And it's really hard to stay completely focused and disciplined on a diet when you're flying back and forth around the country. So um, we decided that for this camp, I was going to do my I started 11 weeks out and um, I did all the 11 weeks at home. However, for the future, I have been speaking with my coaches and I will be cross training more um, specifically with Juliana. Uh, I just she's she's so good. She's amazing. I love the coaching. Um, but I definitely want to do it all in an integrated, friendly manner, because I think it's hard when you're from a really good team. When you start cross training, the last thing I want to do is offend my coaches. So I liked that. They got to kind of meet her at the show this weekend and really just understand that it's, you know, I love all the styles and I'm going to learn all I can to one day so I can follow in Juliana's footsteps and not only be the ultimate fighter, but a UFC champ that came from the ultimate fighter. And then one day when they have another season, I'm going to coach that season. Yes. It's going to come to a full circle, oh my just like Juliana did with Misha. So I really feel that energy and belief in myself. So I'm definitely keeping those doors open um, and, you know, just going about it slow and respectful. And just curious, when did you leave the house? Like how long between leaving the house and this fight? I left the house, I want to say March. Oh, wow. 12. Oh, wow. Long so time we had ago. about five months. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I love the DX chop. And then you were asked about it afterwards. You mentioned your grandmother. So the story is your grandmother came from Brazil, didn't speak English. And uh, this is like mid boom of pro wrestling here in this country and was watching pro wrestling and you used to watch with her as a little, little girl. Yeah. So um, my parents, I, I actually was raised with my grandma from six months to six years old. Wow. So I spent the majority of my childhood with her. So I was raised on pro wrestling and, um, you know, I loved it. Uh, animal undertaker i was like undertaker and kane i have a picture with undertaker when i was like maybe seven years old um and i just loved it we went to the shows and i remember just seeing the pizzazz and the excitement and the outfits and the way that they talked to each other and um i really stuck with the x because i liked all the pranks you know i thought it was so funny how they're always messing with the boss man and having something to say. Uh, so when I started MMA, I told Manolo, I was like, I want to be a pro wrestler. And we would do all these little skits in um, our boxing ring with like Lucha Libre masks just for fun, you know? And he's like, I really want you to try MMA. I think you're going to be good at it. And in my first three fights, I just completely dominated. So I realized that I do got some real shit in these fists that need to be released. But um yeah, I, that, that pro wrestler spirit is always going to live within me. However, specifically for Brogan, you know, she talked so much smack about knocking me the F out, about how I'm going to be laid out on the mat more bloody than Juliana is, how, um, you know, I'm she just no respect for my fighting style, for her to just believe she's going to hit me one time and I'm going to fall down like a little B word. I was just kind of offended at this, like, do you not realize like you're happy to step in the cage with somebody who's really trying to kill you, you know? Um, so I had it planned my pre-interview. I was like, listen, if I, when I finish her, I'm going to stand over her and I'm going to give her the big suck it. And, <laughs> and many things, uh, but a liar ain't one. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. So right upon finish, it was built in my head. I was standing over her, just looking down, like, suck it. Oh my like, God. Yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you are the best. Uh, that was that was incredible. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Uh, just curious, though, like, did you actually originally want to be a pro wrestler before Manny convinced you to go the other way? I did, yeah. Wow. And part of the convincing was um, I had a rough childhood, and people told me you need to buy a gun to defend yourself. And um, I'm like, well, what if some drunk person 
is trying to grab me at what I'm going to shoot him in the head and kill him. I'm not God and nor am I trained in weapons. So I decided I wanted to learn self-defense instead of getting a weapon. You know, what if you're at the club and someone grabs you, you need to learn how to defend yourself. I don't think weapons are always the answer. I think everyone has the right to own a weapon. I love guns. I'm for the law. But for me personally, I'm like, I'm not going to carry this gun with me everywhere I go in fear of being grabbed. So as I started jujitsu and getting good at it, I told him that I was passionate about spreading the word for young adults and women, especially kids, about learning self-defense. And I asked him to put on a seminar. And he's like, no way. The only fight you were ever in, you got effed up. And I was like, okay, fair. What do you want from me? Manolo was like, you need to go win three amateur MMA fights and I will let you host your women's self-defense seminar in 10th Planet San Diego. So uh, that was probably the biggest thing to me is like I wanted to earn the right to be able to teach other women this self-defense that I had changed my life. So, you know, I really did go for it. But in the back of my head, I've always kind of had wrestling and I already have my character picked out and everything. I can't tell you on screen because oh. it's a really good one. Okay. Someone might steal it. But. Okay, okay. <laughs> we'll keep it a secret. Um, there's a lot I want to ask you about what you just said. You mentioned rough childhood. What do you mean by that? Um, when I grew up, my parents were very broke and I was in a really safe, amazing place while I lived with my grandma. But when I was six and I went back home, um, my parents were kind of struggling with a lot and I dealt with a lot of violence in and out of the house. So um, it was it was kind of a constant roller coaster um, growing up in my little town. And where was that? Alpine. Alpine. San Diego. San Diego. Okay. And and uh, are you still in contact with your parents? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I talk to them every day. I love them so much. Um, I'm still super close with my family. Um, and you know what? No families are perfect. I think we've all kind of been through stuff. So, uh, no negativity towards them, but it definitely, uh, created that fight or flight spirit where I'm not a fly. I'm going to, I want to look you in the face and face what's coming at me. Um, I was reading uh, your bio on UFC.com and they asked you when and why did you start training for fighting? And you wrote, what inspired me to begin MMA is I was in an abusive relationship and didn't defend myself and got beat up. I was so angry. I wanted to fight it and not get arrested. So I decided to do it in the cage. Um, and then I saw what you said at the post fight press conference about your nickname and the quote unquote attempted murder. And I was wondering, well, first of all, I couldn't believe no one asked you a follow-up about that because that's not just something that you throw out. Uh, so lucky for you, but are those two stories linked? Um, so what I said at the end of my fight was mostly just a joke, you know, like they call me the killer. So I'm like, oh, you know, you try to kill me. I'm going to get you. Um, that was mostly a joke. Um, so yeah, no, no big connections. Um, I'm not really ready to speak too much into that story. Um, upon the application for ultimate fighter, um, they did background checks. So I had to kind of fully disclose things about my past that now. I just believe are unimportant. I think self-defense is the most important thing, but to open the can of worms of all that, uh, I'm not really prepared for yet because honestly, I want to make everything about me, not about something that I went through with somebody else. Um, so yeah, it was just a joke that probably wasn't too funny that I really okay. sound like you can't joke about that. So, you know. Here we are. Okay. All right. And I, and I respect that. Um, I, I, I saw the clip first about the attempted murder and I was like, I couldn't tell if you were joking or not, to be honest. So then why are you, why is your nickname killer? You know, I'm just, it, it really did just start with a joke of, um, I was like, you know, if, if we're in a cage, I'm going to try to kill you. Like if it's kill or be killed, I'm going for it. How I said the idea of fight or flight when I was younger, I'm the kind of person where if there's a bear in my face, I'm not going to turn and run and let the bear grab me in the back and then bite my head off. I would rather stand up to this bear, you know, brogy the bear kind of funny now. So <laughs> I'd rather stand up to this bear face to face and say, bring it and shoot my shot at going for it as opposed to kind of running away. I do not live my life in fear. So um, that's kind of, you know, like uh, they're like, oh, 
careful with her. Like she'll try to kill you. So in my amateur career, I was the attempted killer. And then upon getting 90% finishes in all my fights, my coach is like, yeah, you're the killer now. Oh, okay. And but I kind of I kind of earned that. And when you said that you wanted to put on the seminar and Manny said you got effed up in your first fight, you got to win three. That was your first amateur fight that you lost? No, I never lost an amateur fight. That was um, an instance that was brought up earlier. I was, you know, it, uh, I was just, I was not in a good relationship and um, there was an altercation and I just didn't defend my, I just didn't know how to defend myself, period. Um, there was definitely in that time, we were all little raver kids. We were drinking, people were under the influence. And as many people know, most of domestic violence situations happen from somebody that you know, obviously it's personal. And most of the time it's because of chemicals. People are not acting themselves because they're drunk, they're blacked out, whatever. So um, it was just, you know, my first ever altercation. I did not defend myself. And I remember I was like, nobody's ever going to touch me like this again. And that was my big thing about getting back into MMA. And then wanting to host these seminars was, you know, once women are traumatized, the majority of women are like, yeah, I'm just, I'm not going to go out anymore. I'm fine. Um, And me, I'm quite the opposite. I'm like, no, learn how to defend yourself. If someone grabs you, you fucking sleep this person. And so in my head, I was like, nobody's ever going to touch me like that again. I don't care if I'm in a fight with somebody for you to get your arms around my neck and squeeze is going to be a very, very difficult task because I've spent my life training for these situations. Um, Especially going back to, to my youth, you know, I was bullied. I was picked on. I was pushed around. I was tiny. I was always grabbed and push push around in all these crazy situations so in, in my adult life one day enough was enough and i'm just like no one's ever gonna touch me like this again and if you try you're gonna get a killer yeah and now you're a freaking ultimate fighter champion so shove that let's go, let's go. suck <laughs> it haters can i ask you a question yeah there it is nice i love it um what is that thing on on your wall uh like you you wrote a few things on the wall there what is that i have a great something oh wow Okay, yeah, I'll show you. So um, I do affirmations. Let's see if I can flip the video. Okay, yeah. And can you turn your Uh, your, your camera? Yeah, like that. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Perfect. Yeah, so I haven't changed it yet since leaving. It says, I have a great personality on the show. It is okay. People love me. I talked just enough. I am unbreakable. I am unstoppable. I am the tough 30 ultimate fighter. I am abundant. I put on a show and win a fight bonus. And then it says tough champion. And you wrote that before the show. No, I wrote this as soon as I got home. So before the show, before the show, I had different things about like making it to the finale. As soon as I got home, I came and I wrote this because um, I was terrified that I talked way too much. And I'm like, I said too much they're going to hate me. Like I was way too much myself. I was too wild. And so I put, you know, that I just, I talked just enough that it's going to be okay. I was terrified. Uh, Here's the thing. If you create a persona, it's not that scary because you're like, Oh, it's not really me. The world doesn't really know the real me. So it's fine for me. I was like, no, I was really myself a hundred percent of the time. Every time that I called someone out or every time that I was fighting for what I believed in, like, I'm really like that. So that was definitely my fear is like, well, the world knows me now. <laughs> I lo- and are you happy with how you came across on the show? Yeah, I am actually. I I was still kind of nervous about it until uh, the morning of the fights. I went out to breakfast with my team and this passerby, I wish I got his name. He stopped me and was like, hey, I just want you to know I watched the show. Thank you for everything you said. He was battling manic depression his son had passed away and he was in this really dark place. And he's like, I could tell through what you were saying that you knew what that was like. And he's like, you know, you gave me the motivation to not only not want to quit, but to go for all these things that I've been thinking of, like, should I try? And he's been in this mental space of struggling. And he said that my story motivated him. And this was right before I fought Brogan. And it really made me realize like, yes, there's tons of haters just talking mad smack, but if I can change one life, just one, then everything was worth it. And now I know that not only did I change one, I changed many of people who have 
been through these type of things just by being able to be vocal about it. You know, you don't need to get deep into the nitty gritty, but we've all struggled through something that if you could do one thing to help someone else, for me, my passion is about helping younger kids learn self-defense and women that have been traumatized learn self-defense because, you know, really four years ago, I was a nobody on a couch crying all day, every day, super depressed, no no idea where my life is going to be for me to be able to pick myself back up, get my head on straight and say, I'm going to do something with my life really means that if I could do it, anyone can. And, um, yeah, I just like, now that I've heard some real life people that stop me in my tracks while I'm just trying to get, get food, it really did take my breath away and made me realize like, I'm proud of everything that I set up there. I'm proud of the woman I've become. And, um, as embarrassing it is, I'm proud of all the things that I have overcome, you know, with violent situations or depression that, um, you know, you really can overcome all that and uh, be a spirit that people will look up to. I think a lot of people have um, have some trouble with that first step. Like you talked about being on the couch and feeling like a nobody and feeling depressed. How did you make that first step on the path to this? Like, what would you say to someone who right now is feeling that exact way? How do you get out of the house go to a gym, go to talk to someone, go, you know, like that to me is always the toughest part of it all. What, what did you do? Absolutely. It took me maybe 90 hours, almost, almost damn near four days. My brother's in his room. He would even come out and testify this about four days. Um, after this situation that I went through, I wouldn't drink water. I wasn't eating food. I could barely get up out of bed. And then, um, this is actually what really changed my life. I was sitting there and I had this like premonition or vision of myself and I was 80 years old and the 80 year old me started crying and uh, it was weird. It was like a lucid dream or something like I was awake, but I wasn't awake. And someone asked the 80 year old me like, why are you crying? And I was crying because I was mad that I spent so much of my youth being miserable that I didn't enjoy my life while I was young and full of energy. And um, as I started like opening my eyes and coming back from this meditative state or whatever I was in, I was like, oh my God, I've wasted 22 years of my life being miserable. What am I doing with myself? And I was like, I need to go do something. And then I'm like, back to that place of, well, what am I going to go do? And then I realized The only thing that's going to pull me out of this is something I'm passionate about. So I was like, what brings a passion in me? And I started watching jujitsu matches and MMA fights. And I was like, I'm passionate about self-defense. I want to do something to change this. I don't want, I want to help change the world. So I got outward focused. Anytime I looked at myself, whether it was in a mirror or I started focusing on me and my life, I would just break down. But when I flipped the script and I was like, what about the kids, these kids, what can I do for these kids? And I was like, how can I possibly help a kid while I'm on a couch miserable? I'm never going to help anyone on this couch. So really shifting to the outward focus pulled me up and out of my shit because I realized there's nothing you can do to help anyone else when you're in the lowest of lows. And, um, it, it really brought me back. And I think that a lot of the thanks comes to these emotional intelligence classes. I did, like I said before, Um, People are like, if you're so emotionally intelligent, why are you emotional and, you know, so outspoken? It's like, man, I don't take these classes because I was born with intelligence. I took these classes because I was crazy. And I'm trying to be a better version of myself to help not only me, but my family and to be a positive member in society instead of a menace that's taking all these antidepressants and constantly causing trouble everywhere I go. I just wanted to be the change that this world needed. And that shifted my whole attitude, my whole outlook. I got passionate and, um, I just started to realize like, I'm the one, like I felt in my heart that like I was born for this, that I'm going to do something that's really, really going to change something. And, um, you know, I just got focused and I say all the time, I just shot my shot. I just went for it. Anytime there was an opportunity, I was like, yes, you know, a jujitsu match in Mexico for a hundred bucks in Mexico city where I don't even speak Spanish. Fuck it. Yes. Anything going on, you know, like, uh, combat jujitsu against, against the goat, the greatest woman of all time who 
people were calling me saying, don't do it. You're going to get broken. You're going to get smashed. I was like, well, I've already been broken. Yes, let's go. And I just became the person to go for it, no matter what the outcome. And it brought me to where I am now, you know. Um, But that being said, I stayed ready to be able to accept these opportunities. As soon as I got myself off the couch, I was training all day, every day for about six hours a day. And on the days that I was working, it would be three hours a day. So I just kept showing up and stayed ready. And then as soon as there's any opportunity, you know, I was just that yes woman and I went for it. Wow. You're an inspiration. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Reminds me of a quote that I repeated to myself a million times uh, throughout my life. 80% of success is just showing up. Just show up and good things will happen. And I think a lot more people need to believe that because you can always find excuses as to why you should not show up or can't show up. Just show up. Good things happen. By the way, can you use those nunchucks? Can you, uh, can you show the? Oh, totally. Oh, totally. Let's... What do we got? What we it's, got? it's been a while. I'm actually surprised they uh, didn't really show it much on Ultimate Fighter. Um, but on my tough season, I walked around with these nunchucks literally most of the time. Oh, there we go. Oh, this is great. Yeah, and I had so much fun with it. It's just like, wow. I walked around like this, and like people would be like, oh, you're going to hit me in the face. Stop doing that. But I just didn't care. I had so much fun. I think the first time I met Dana, I was actually sitting there with nunchucks, and he's looking at me like, who the fuck is this girl? Wow. And, yeah. You're like a you're like a young Nick Diaz out there. You ever see Nick do it? Hey, hey, no, I haven't, but I should. I just uh, there's actually this girl Hope Chase in Invicta. I saw her have these, and I knew I was going to get bored in the house. So without knowing any nunchucks, all these tricks I taught myself in Ultimate <laughs> Fighter just via being bored. So I would go outside and start swinging them around. <laughs> I love it. Well done. By the way, those uh, side jobs you had like four of them, right? No yes, more? Are, you, are we done? Yeah. <laughs> now you're a full-time fighter? Uh, yes, I am a full-time fighter. Actually, uh, I, I'm definitely a full-time fighter, but I, I'm actually working one of my side jobs now. I'm puppy sitting for my boss, Uncle Bill, because he uh, he's actually one of my corners and coaches. He's gone for Alima's fight. Oh, right. So um, I'm with his puppies now, but... I used to work at a cryotherapy place. I'll be a bartender. I did massage therapy. And um, yeah, now as soon as I get my bonuses from, you know, my ultimate fighter finishes and fight of the season, full-time fighter, baby. Yeah, I'm so stoked. I finally earned my spot in freedom. (laughs) Juliana, what a pleasure this has been. Uh, Really great to meet you. Congratulations on everything you've accomplished so far. Congrats on winning the show. Congrats on the fight this past Saturday. And, uh, you're an inspiration. Congratulations on that as well. You really are. And I hope that you continue to be a great role model for the youth, for young women. Everything you said is uh, incredibly inspiring. So I salute you. Good luck to your teammate, Alima Le, later on this week. Good luck to the team. And I can't wait to watch your, your UFC career. We are now rooting for you. We are on your side. We wish the best for you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time and energy. And honestly, Interviews are usually pretty scary, but I feel like I'm talking to a friend. So thanks for making this so easy and fun. And uh, I'm grateful for you. I hope you have a great day. I appreciate it. And give him an old. Next time somebody wants to talk shit about me, I'm going to yeah. stand over them and be like, suck it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Juliana. Take care. What a legend. Wow. Uh, She is incredible. 